we're going to have a rather informal session, and I know some of us have questions that we want to ask her, and, and I'm going to ask you to please talk about anything that you think is relevant to elementary education majors, which seems to be the largest portion of the audience here this morning. Do we have anyone from social work here? Okay, so it is exclusively education, yes? Okay, all right. Um, and some folks who are interested in second language um, learners also, English as a second language. Um, Dr. Nodding's books include Starting at Home, Caring and Social Policy, The Challenge to Care in Schools, which I hope she'll talk a little bit about, and then of course, Educating Moral People. And uh, we also have her lecture from last evening on videotape, so we can revisit some of the wonderful points that she made and uh, talk more about what she has to offer to us uh, after we get back from spring break, even after she leaves us. So uh, please join me this morning in welcoming Dr. Nell Nodding. Uh, well, I, I thought there were going to be some people from um, social work here, so I'll have to ch change uh, what I'm talking about a little bit. But I, I'd like to get um, two or three concepts out there and then respond to your questions. So we'll try to make this uh, a, a more interactive kind of session. Last night I did mention uh, what I regard as a very important distinction. That is the distinction between expressed and inferred needs. And this is important for anyone in the caregiving professions to understand. And it's important in parenting. So often when we talk about meeting needs, we're talking about needs that we have identified, not that the kids have identified. These are inferred needs. We suppose the kids have certain needs. I've even heard parents talk about the need for a good spanking. Okay. Now the kid doesn't express that need. That's for sure. That is an inferred need if there ever was one. <coughs> and one of the uh, most difficult and important things we have to do as parents and teachers is to keep that distinction in mind and make sure that we at least hear the expressed needs. What does the child say she needs? Now, we may disagree when we hear what the child thinks she needs. And then, if this were a philosophy class, we'd spend some time talking about the difference between wants and needs. Not everything I want is a need. And there are criteria for judging when we should regard a want as a need. We'll talk about that, too. But the important thing for um, our business for the conversation this morning is the uh, attentiveness required, the, the listening, finding out what the cared for expresses as a need. Sometimes when you hear these needs, your heart just sinks because you know you can't possibly meet this need. It's far too great a magnitude or it's a need you don't want to meet because it's too awful. You want to talk the person out of this and into something healthier. All of that is a possibility when you really listen to people, when you listen to your own kids, when you listen to your students. So it requires considerable sensitivity and even artistry to try to bring these things together. Uh, now, there was a, a day in public education when we believed, along with John Dewey, that students should be involved in the construction of their own learning objectives. I still believe that. I think it is essential. I think it is important. And in fact, <coughs> Dewey said that there was no more important point than that in progressive education that that was the single most important point. The organic connection, he said, between purpose and learning, what you do. So I've never been a, an enthusiastic advocate of uh, behavioral objectives or having a specific learning objective for every class that you teach. Now, 
it's possible that you're being pressed to do that because most of the public schools in the country are doing that. And there are even some where an administrator will judge you as a teacher by whether you have that learning objective up on the board for the day. This is what we're going to be doing. This is what you will learn. You see, what people miss in that, when they talk that way, when they say, as a result of whatever I'm doing today, you will do such and such, they forget to add a little phrase on the end of that. That is, if you want to. See? Kids are not necessarily going to do what you want them to do. They have to want to. And so somehow or other, you have to bring these, these things together. I'll give a specific example here. Many years ago, in working with the first bunch of kids that I worked with long before my university work, <clears throat> I taught the same bunch of kids for three years. I taught them in sixth grade, and we stayed together for seventh grade, and then stayed together for eighth grade. It was a wonderful experience. But sometime during that period, these kids were into uh, writing their absence notes in lemon juice. I mean, this is secret writing. It disappears. How they got their parents to sign these, I don't know. Or maybe they signed them themselves. But they would bring me these notes in disappearing ink. And so I would have to light a match or have some, a candle or something underneath it in order to read the messages. Well, I thought, hmm. Now, you see, you could get angry at that and say, your parents never wrote this and have a fit. Uh, but I thought, what does this mean? What does it suggest? And thinking of the age of the kids, it suggested to me an interest in secret languages and codes and that sort of thing. And I'm interested in that sort of thing too. So I thought, well, I'm going to find some stories to read that include uh, codes. So uh, we read uh, Edgar Allan Poe's The Gold Bug, you know, where there's an important code. And then there's uh, one of the Sherlock Holmes ones, uh, what is it called? It's the one in which there are all the semaphores, and you, you have to figure out the uh, language there. So we read that, and I <clears throat> encouraged them to study uh, oh, you know, just the basic little bits of cryptography. What letter in the English alphabet appears more than any other? Which is the one that appears most? You know? E, yeah. That's the one that appears most. Uh, and the consonant, I think, if I remember correctly, that appears most is T, but I'm not absolutely sure of that. So anyway, we spent some time uh, studying that and a vowel and consonant arrangement. I mean, we had a wonderful time. But you see what the, uh, what principle is operating there. Kids are motivated. I even wrote an article a few years ago called Must We Motivate? If we were not motivated, as living organisms, we'd die. So we're, we're all motivated. But now the question is, what are we motivated to do? And the task of the teacher is to find that motivation. And that's why you have to listen to these expressed needs, why you have to be attentive. What are the kids interested in? Which of those interests are healthy? Which are not? See, that's where you use your own judgment. You don't throw out all the inferred needs. And how can you use these expressed needs or interests, the motivation, the genuine motivation, how can you bend that a little bit, shape it in a direction that uh, will be helpful for their future in, uh, in academic work? Now, where else can you do that sort? You can do it everywhere. You, you can give assignments that have choice built into them. And that, too, is important. You say, here's, here's the kind of thing I want you to learn, uh, but now here are the ways you can do it. And you give a whole array of things. Not so many that you can't handle them, so there's got to be a practical thing here. Sometimes when I uh, give talks of this sort, people with great idealism rush out and try to have individual lessons for every kid. Well, that, that's wonderful, but you can't do it. It's too much you begin to bog down. And so you have to say, how can I compromise on that? So you don't go home and say, well, that can't be done. You say, how can it be done? See, how can it be done? Uh, and so through my years as a math teacher, when I decided that uh, 
kids were going to have, they were going to be able to take tests over again if they failed them. Now, there was the most practical of reasons for doing this. I was so sick of what you call, what I call, cumulative ignorance. You know, when kids would come to me in April, they'd done nothing all year, and they'd come to me, oh, now Miss Nottings, oh, I'm going to work at it, I'm going to do it fine. And I thought, oh, my heart would just sink. Because all the stuff they didn't learn from September through March, now they were going to try to cram in and they were going to do just fine. I knew it just, you know, it just wasn't possible. So I said, no more of this, no more of this. From now on, you got to pass chapter one before you go on to chapter two. You have to pass chapter two before you go on to chapter three. It's, it's really, it's kind of a version of mastery learning. It's, but I'm not insisting everybody gets 90%, but you have to at least pass it. Now see, what does that require of you as a teacher? You have to ask yourself, what's really essential? What do they have to know from chapter one in order to have a shot at doing chapter two? Do you want to settle for that? No, because you also want to invite some of the kids who have expressed interest in math to do even more. So you construct your test this way. I constructed the test so that the first seven questions were sort of essential. You really had to know this stuff. The eighth was a little harder. The ninth was quite challenging, and the tenth was a real challenge, see? So that you've, you've got something built in there for the whole range of kids. Further, I thought, well, you know, why, why put failing or F on the test? It's enough to just say not passing. Not passing, it means you have to take it again. Not the very same one. See, now there's another complication. It means that you have to learn how to construct equivalent forms of the test. And so I had a whole file drawer full of them, eventually. It was a lot of work. Are they equivalent? How do you judge whether they're equivalent? That you have to do, too. <clears throat> so these are, uh, I've given you just a couple examples of um, how you might work with the kids' interests and the things that you have to do uh, as a teacher. Another one that I, I have never taught English, although I've been encouraged to try it a number of times. In fact, I was made an honorary English teacher by teachers at the University of British Columbia. And it's because I'm an avid reader, I'm an omnivorous reader. And in talking to this group, I found people who had been reading a lot of the books that I was reading. They were so happy, and I was so happy, that they gave me a certificate of I'm now an honorary English teacher. However, most of what we do in high school English turns people off, not on. That is a very, very sad thing. Why in the world would we make all kids suffer through the Scarlet Letter, for example? Now, is it a wonderful book? Some people think it is a wonderful book. Most kids do not think it is a wonderful book. And I watched a bunch of kids at a local high school two years ago, suffer through the Scarlet Letter. They spent a whole semester on it, a whole semester. At the end of that semester, the kids hated the Scarlet Letter, hated reading, and hated the teacher. Now, if that's the kind of outcome you want, you know, spend a semester on the Scarlet Letter. This is not what you want, though. It's not what you should want. Wouldn't it be neat, at the high school level at least, if you organized your literature classes like miniature book clubs? See, uh, Have a list of books, ask the kids which ones they'd like to read. As soon as you get three or four or five kids who want a specific book, okay, that's the book that you're going to be reading, and you've got another group of kids who will be reading another one. See how you have to be practical in the sense that if you've got 30 kids in the class, you can't have them all reading a different one except for book reports, of course, if you're going to insist on book reports. But when you want real discussion, when you want to probe some of the existential questions, why not have these little book clubs? So you've got maybe four books being read instead of one. Your eye there is on what I think is important. Your hope is 
that you're inviting lifelong interest in reading. That you're saying, hey, reading is neat. Reading's wonderful. You should want to do it. Well, then organize your lessons in a way that shows that, not in a way that makes kids think, geez, I hope I never see a book again. Uh, and that too often is the case. One more example in the same line, and then let's uh, talk about things. Um, poetry. Why do we teach poetry? Because it helps you get a better job? Well, no, not likely, but better stick to computer software if you're talking strictly of better. So why do we teach poetry? Anybody want to volunteer an answer? Yeah, Patty. Love of language. You're you're hoping. You're hoping that people will enjoy poetry, that they will find lifelong delight and wisdom. These are the two things that I always mention: lifelong delight and wisdom in poetry. Well, then why would you spend all your time on metaphors and figures of speech and dactylic hexameter and why would you do that? I don't, I don't think I have ever run across a little kid, seven or younger, who doesn't love poetry. They all love it. They love the, the rhythm of it. They love the language play. When I'm walking on the boardwalk with grandchildren, I often say to them, a wonderful bird is the pelican. Its beak can hold more than its belly can. And then the last line is, but I can't see how the hell it can. And they can say, Grandma, you know. But okay, so this is doggerel. This is the lowest rung of poetry, maybe. But still, it you know it it kind of gets kids into it. And and here's here's a, a game to play. We we do it at uh, uh, at dinner in the summer when we've got a lot of the kids and grandchildren there. I'll say, whose woods these are, I think uh, I know. And then I pause, and someone else will say, his house is in the village, though. And I say, he will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. See, and that's the game we play. I, one line and the other. And the little kids there look back and forth, and they think, gosh, grown-ups, you know, grown-ups like poetry. They read poetry, and they recite poetry. Well, that's why we teach poetry. So don't wreck it when you get out there. I mean, you want to invite kids to enjoy it. Would I ever have them memorize poetry? Sure I would, but I'd ask them to select the poem that they would like to memorize and then recite it for the class because some people uh, use poetry as a sort of spiritual exercise. We don't do spiritual exercises in the public schools and we shouldn't, I don't believe we should, <clears throat> but non-religious spiritual exercises you can do. And poetry is, in a sense, a spiritual exercise. Okay, well, I've given you a couple uh, examples, and now I want to hear from you. And if you don't have any questions or any comments, then I will go on to phase two here, so you better ask questions. <laughs> You'll have to you'll have to talk loud. Yeah. Well, this is the question that pushes the buttons. Of course, I hate the things. I just hate them uh, when they're associated with high stakes. Look, we had standardized tests when I was teaching math 30 years ago in the schools. <clears throat> At the end of Algebra 1, we'd give a standardized test. At the end of Algebra 2, we'd give a standardized test. But these grades did not appear on the kids' report cards. Uh, they were not used to compare teacher to teacher and school to school. They were not published in the local newspaper. We gave them because we wanted to see how we're doing. And as teachers, as educators, we should want to know how we're doing. We should want to know whether the year was a disaster, but you know, you don't need a standardized test to know that. You know when the year was a disaster. So I've, uh, 
I am every bit as opposed to them as Alfie Cohn is. And he and I try to support each other, give moral support to one another in this very difficult age in which we're living. Look, just think how pernicious it is. We compare child against child and teacher against teacher and school against school and district against district and state against state and nation against nation. What are we trying to accomplish by doing this? It's pernicious. And in the, in the county where I live now, which is a, uh, it's an affluent county, but it has pockets of severe poverty. Uh, you can drive around, we've done it. I mean, just get in your car, drive around the county, and you can come back and list the school districts from top to bottom without giving the test. We call this the windshield test. Just drive around and look. You don't need to give the test. You know which communities are going to have the high scores, which communities are going to have the low scores. So what does that tell you? I mean, that, see, this is really important, not just for you as teachers, but for you as citizens. This tremendous drive on standardized tests, high stakes testing, this push to get the schools to do this thing, to produce equity, that is to give everyone a fair chance at the goods of this society, and the schools are supposed to do it. I really think this is an enormous, a monumental distraction from the real social problems in this country that have to be handled at another level. See? So if the schools are going to make everybody rich, or at least out of poverty, we don't have to think about the people who are actually living in poverty. About 40 million people in this country with no medical insurance. About people living in unlivable housing. People who can't afford decent housing. Kids who have maybe a decent day in school and then have to walk home through dangerous streets to unlivable housing. And see if, if, if I, as a politician, can convince you that it's the school's fault, the schools have to do something about it, then we don't have to think about these social problems. So you've asked a question, you can tell it makes me mad. It makes me really mad because I think about the community right next door to the one in which I am living, which happens to be at the bottom of the heap, lowest income, poorest housing, of course the lowest test scores, and it's published in the paper. So what do we do to the poor? We say, well, you're not only poor economically, you're stupid too, right? That's nasty. It's very nasty. Uh, yeah, we could go on talking about these difficulties. Places that are reconstituting schools, schools called failing schools, where there are lots, not all, but lots of fine teachers working hard to make life better for the kids. So they're all fired. They have to apply to be rehired. A lot of them won't even bother. They won't even bother. Okay, go, go somewhere else. I'm not appreciated here. The heck with it. Uh, and so what is increasingly happening, of course, is that the teachers who have no options, for the most part, stay in these schools, and they're not getting any better. It's, 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 see, it isn't, it isn't just at the level of the individual teacher that you have to work with the other's motivation. It's at the level of working with teachers, too. In talking with superintendents and listening to superintendents, I sometimes hear a few who will say, I am hard on my teachers because I care about the kids. I say to myself, if you don't care about your teachers, that caring isn't going to happen in the classrooms because care in an important sense is transitive. The superintendent cares for the teachers, the teachers are more likely to care for the kids. And as the teachers care for the kids, the kids are more likely to care for one another. I mean, this is something that just keeps getting passed along. So you aren't going to do the kids of your district or state a favor by being mean and nasty and hard on the teachers. It's just, you know, it's just bad psychology. It just doesn't make sense. Now, well, your question was, what, what do you do as a teacher? This is what I would do. I would help the kids 
as much as I can to do as well as is reasonable to expect on the test. I certainly would not say to the kids, and I didn't when I was a math teacher, these things are not important, so we're not going to bother with them. We're going to concentrate on what really is important. I could have said that in teaching juniors who were getting ready to take the SATs. I wouldn't say that to them, because in their lives, the SATs are important. You're, you may remember going through it yourself and how desperately you wanted to get decent scores there. So in a couple of weeks before the SATs, I spent time on them. I said, you know, we spent time on, on how to take a test. We looked, at, uh, we looked at the things mathematically. That is, what, what's your expected return? How many do you have to eliminate before you've got a really good shot uh, and, and should guess? We spent time on that. We actually figured out the values on it. Uh, we talked about how to, how to spot the likely correct answer in analogies and a lot of these vocabulary things. You know, if there, if there are, you're looking at multiple choice now. If there are two answers that look alike or sound alike, the chances are very good that one of them is the right answer. You have to get into the mind of the test maker, because when the test maker puts together a question, you've got the answer. Now the next thing you have to do is come up with something called distractors. Distractors are the unright answers. And how do you come up with these distractors? Usually you say, well, something that sounds like it or looks like it, and that is always in there. And then the other two are usually goofy kinds of things. But when, whenever you spot that, two things that look alike or sound alike, the chances are very good that one of them is the answer. So we spent a little time talking about those things. I made sure that over the year in uh, second year algebra, we covered most of the topics that were likely to come up there. And when the kids came back after taking the test on that Monday, I'd say, was there anything on there that you hadn't seen? And if there was, then I made sure that the kids the next year did see it, that's all. But you don't turn your whole curriculum over to it. You don't wreck what you do in the classroom. You don't use it as an excuse never to tell a story or never to do anything on uh, biography or logic puzzles or all the wonderful things that you can do in math. Uh, you pay what last night I called adequate attention to this thing that you're forced to do, but you don't give over your whole your whole teaching career to it. It's just, I hope it goes away soon, but there isn't any sign of it's going away right now. Does that help some? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I know people who actually advocate cheating on it. I mean, some of my graduate students at Teachers College said they didn't blame teachers in New York City for changing the score and giving the kids the answers because the whole thing is so pernicious. And I said, no, I would never do that. I mean, you're setting an example for your kids of honor and trustworthiness. Uh, and I would never do that. But on the other hand, I would also tell them that I'm opposed to the movement, that I sympathize with them. I certainly wouldn't tell them, you know, this is a, a need. Yeah. Okay, other questions? Yeah, Patty. Well, a couple bits of advice. Uh, since <coughs> we do have a teacher shortage in this country, whether you have it in this county, uh, you know, right in your own backyard, I don't know. 
but there are lots of other places in the country, and we do have a teacher shortage. And when you interview for a job, you have a right to ask questions as well as answer them. And you might want to find out something about the uh, pedagogical philosophy before you take a job in a school. I mean, I certainly would not go into a school that uses assertive discipline and insists on a specific learning objective every single day and has scripted lessons. I mean, I just wouldn't go there. That's all. I, you know, go to the next town. Find a place that uh, has its head screwed on right. I mean, you, you won't want to work in a place like that. And if you take a job there, you're going to be complaining and unhappy and stressed disgruntled and that's no way to, to start out. So, okay, so you find a place that's at least reasonable and you take a job there. The next thing is find one or two or three highly experienced, wonderful, passionate teachers and hook up with them. Don't spend your time in the teacher's lounge where you're likely to hear the worst conversation that goes on. I mean, some of the conversation in the teacher's room is just awful, where they say terrible things about the kids, terrible things about the school, just groan and grumble, and, and it's a downer. Uh, so keep your ears open and find these two or three, or even one really wonderful, passionate teacher who, you know, a person who is experienced and still loves kids and wants to do things. That is very, very important. <clears throat> Years ago, I watched a young man who joined our faculty, this is when I was a high school teacher, who came in with enormous enthusiasm. I thought he was going to be good. But he spent all his time with the most miserable people on the faculty. And pretty soon, he was just like them. That's a very sad story. but. It happens, so that's, that's the second thing I would do. And then, and then the third thing I'd do is to remember that kids are fun. They really are. Now, as, as you know, I've raised a lot of kids and I've taught for many, many years, and they can also be a pain in the neck. I mean, there's no question about that. There are days when you cheerfully give them back. We were talking at breakfast, you send them back and get a refund. But, uh, but most days are, are not like that. And so don't, don't give up that element of fun. It's, um, it should be there. Your classroom should be fun. And that doesn't mean that it's wild, and it doesn't mean the kids aren't learning anything. Uh, learning can be fun, and you want to get that across. So don't let them get you into scripted lessons where the only thing that matters is uh, the kids answering questions. The end of it. That's that's a mistake. So, what does that mean for you as a teacher? I I hope it means that there'll be a, a continual striving for competence. I wrote an article a few years ago entitled "Caring and Competence" because I was so tired of people talking about caring as a sort of warm, fuzzy attitude. It's a lot more than a warm, fuzzy attitude. When you really care, you want to be competent to do what the kids need to. And that means that you've got to keep learning, you've got to keep trying. There's no end to it. it. You know, there really isn't any end to it because every conversation you have with a kid says, gee, there's something else I should know a little more about. You know? And everything you read begins to connect with what you want to do in the classroom. I have little yellow stickies on all kinds of books at home. In addition to the, uh, all the professional books that I read, I like mystery stories. I mean, this is my recreation, mystery stories. I have cords of them. In fact, we're trying now to think which ones we could part with in order to make more room on the shelves, you know, how, how that gets. And even in the mystery books, there are little stickies on some pages because there are references that will be useful someday, stories that I would like to tell in uh, in classes and meetings. And, and that's what happens. And with elementary school teachers, when I watched elementary school teachers and I've talked with them, almost everything in their lives is somehow connected to their teaching. 
the meals that they cook, the shows that they see on TV, the songs that they sing, all of these things are somehow connected and they think to themselves, gee, Johnny would like that, or, or Susie might be interested in that. And so your, your life sort of, uh, it, it's built around that teaching center. And that's not a bad thing. I think that's a good thing. Yeah. So a, a valid question to ask for your own life, too, and for the lives of your children is, how much fun have you had recently? Or how much fun are you having? I mean, that's a valid question. It's not the only one to ask, but it certainly is a, a valid one. why I wouldn't use it. Exactly. Yeah. Because when something happens in the, in the classroom, something uh, that you don't particularly want to have happen, that is against the rules, there usually is a reason for it. And it is something worth talking about. Now again, this is something that requires some sensitivity. There are times when you wouldn't want to talk about it right then and there because it would cause embarrassment or humiliation, and I'll give an example of that in a minute. But there are lots of other times when you can just stop things uh, and, and talk about it a little bit. You can say to kids, look, um, I thought we agreed that we wouldn't do such and such, that we wouldn't use that kind of language, let's say. I mean, this is a problem in schools that I didn't face when I was a teacher. I mean, really, truly, honestly, kids did not use this sort of bad language. I mean, they probably did out in the hall, but they never did in the classroom. I mean, I don't know what I would have done if a kid had said F you in the classroom. I mean, it just never happened. Um, people didn't use that kind of language. It just wasn't there at all. But if, if a kid does use language that's unacceptable, I would be inclined to stop the class then and say, look, I thought we had agreed in here that we would not use that sort of language. And then usually all the other kids will say, yeah, you're off base, Joe. Now, what does that presuppose? It presupposes that somewhere along the line you had a sort of um, um, class discussion, a class forum, and you agreed on, on the rules by which the classroom would be run. They could be written down. Some places insist that you write them down and post them up front. I wouldn't do that. Uh, because if, if they're too specific, they represent a challenge to some kids. You know? I would rather, rather get the spirit of the thing across. And that's why you stop and talk to remind them of the spirit of the thing. If you see one kid treat another kid in a really mean way, you stop and you say, hey, we don't do that in here. We've, this is a safe place. We want everybody to feel safe. And so you do talk about it and you invite uh, discussion on it. Now, there are some really hard, tricky problems. I've watched a class once and it was in a school where the teacher had to have a learning objective, where they used assertive discipline, where nothing, nothing was supposed to interrupt the academic lesson. And in the back of the room, a boy made an obscene remark to the girl next to him. It was an obscene invitation, actually. And she rejected it. And then he said, you ought to be flattered. Uh, nobody else would bother with a cow like you. This was the remark. The teacher heard her, and she said, now, let's be sure everybody's on page 68. Now, see, that's, that's wrong. That's, that's wrong. But how do you treat it now? You don't want to add to the girl's embarrassment. Uh, what I would do in a case like that is to say straight out to the boy, we don't talk to one another like that in here. We agreed on it. 
I don't ever want to hear anything like that again, and I'll talk to you later. See, now the rest of the class doesn't know what he said, doesn't know to whom he said it, and so afterward you've got to talk to the girl and assure her that she did not deserve a remark like that. You have to talk to him and let him know that this is a serious matter and we aren't going to do this. But you don't just let it go. See? You don't just let it go. It's, it is far more important than whatever trivial learning objective you were trying to get across that day. One more thing on that is that years from now, you're just starting out in teaching. It's a scary thing to realize that 20 years from now, 30 years from now, even 50 years from now, some kids will remember things that you did in the classroom. And it won't be that you taught them the 2 plus 3 equals 5. That, you know, they know they learned that somewhere. That isn't what they'll remember. They'll remember something really nice and supportive that you did, or something cruel and sort of negligent that you did. I have a uh, good friend who teaches at the uh, University of Southern Florida, and he has gathered together a, a whole book of these little uh, case notes. What it, he had adults write letters, letters that would never be posted, mind you, uh, to teachers. And half the letters are uh, to teachers remembering something caring that the teachers did. And the other half are letters to teachers remembering something cruel and humiliating that they did. These really are, they're something to read. You read them and you think, wow, is what I do every day that important? And the answer is yes, it is. And you read those and you, you realize how one friendly gesture can mean so much and how one nasty remark can also mean so much. Now, does that mean it's the end of the world if you ever make a nasty remark or you hurt a kid? It'd be a remarkable teacher who never did something like that. Because we all get tired, we all get frustrated. There are times when we don't know, we don't realize that this particular kid can't take that kind of remark where the kid next to him can take it and shrug it off. We don't know and we do it uh, and we feel terrible afterward. But it doesn't mean that you should go home and sit in sackcloth and ashes and give up the profession. It just means that you, you know, be sensitive to it. Uh, and remember that that really can happen. Yeah. It is difficult. I wouldn't stand here and, and tell you that it isn't. Uh, it requires some compromises, but it does not require you to give up everything important that you're doing. Now, <clears throat> to their credit, many superintendents in this country are beginning to wake up to this. And instead of just pursuing all this in a compliant sort of way, they're beginning to fight back. I know they are in Michigan, because I've spent quite a bit of time there now. And the Michigan superintendents are about ready to say enough already. We're, we're wrecking our schools with this. Uh, so you, it, it, it's hard work, harder than it should be. But you have to believe that this other way of operating, giving kids choices, guiding them, inviting them, encouraging them, enticing them. Listen, you see, listen to those words and contrast them with the words requiring and insisting and demanding and even expecting, for that matter. Uh, should we expect the same from all kids? I don't think so. I mean, when you say have high expectations, how do you define that? You have high expectations 
for each child within that child's interests and abilities. But you don't have the same expectations for everyone. Okay. Now, I could ask you straight out, do you believe that all children can learn algebra and geometry? I don't. I really don't. I mean, I taught it for many years. I loved my students. I was pretty good at it. I mean, the standardized tests were always pretty good. But not all kids can learn algebra and geometry if by that we mean real algebra and geometry. We've got a lot of phony courses out there now, and I've watched kids go through these phony courses. Imagine going through a whole year of algebra without a single word problem. You say, oh, wow, this is heaven. Well, yeah, but it's not algebra, see? And so all over the country now, we have kids going through courses like that, geometry without a proof, not one the whole year. And the kids have algebra and geometry on their transcript, and they go to college thinking they're prepared, and they are not prepared at all. What a shock. Now they need remedial courses, and maybe even that won't catch them up, and so we have a large number of dropouts at the college level. See, that's pedagogical fraud, and yet I can see why teachers have done it. They now have to teach all kids algebra and geometry. They don't want their kids to fail, so they pare the course down till it doesn't have any guts at all, and then think they have done the right thing by the kids. And they haven't. So. I would add to that when I say I don't think all kids can, in any meaningful way, learn algebra and geometry. My next answer to it is, so what? So what? There's more to life than algebra and geometry, see? And even as a math teacher, I believe that. Kids come to you with all kinds of interests and talents, wonderful interests and talents, and when a kid says, God, I hate math, I wish I didn't have to be in there, the right answer to it is, I'm sorry. You know, I can understand. Uh, but you're stuck with it, you have to take it, I have to teach you, and I'll do the best I can to help you through it. That, you shouldn't say, oh, math is wonderful, and you're going to love it. And Why? Well, they may love other things. Now, mind you, I wouldn't want people to like it less because of the way I teach it. I feel very bad about that. But I don't feel a responsibility to make everyone love the subject just because I do. I mean, geez, think about it. They'd have to love English and history and science and math and music and art and every subject. It's asking too much. And be a very lukewarm love, then, also. In, the, uh, in this book, Starting at Home, I, uh, <clears throat> one of the really important concepts in it is the discussion of negative dessert. And I argue very strongly against this, that in the best homes and the best classrooms, we very rarely use negative dessert. And what do I mean by that? I mean, you've done something bad, so something bad should happen to you. That's negative dessert. Our whole criminal justice system is based on that negative dessert. You do something bad, you deserve to have something bad done to you. Use that as little as possible. I mean, there, there may be times when you have to, but almost always you can avoid it. And you can substitute for it what I've called positive dessert. That is, first there's a layer of things that are unconditional needs that you never, never withhold. You don't withhold love, you don't withhold food. Oh, like, you know, occasionally bad kid has spilled everything at the table, no dessert for you, that's no big deal. But but it's on, sort of on the edge. You don't withhold food. You certainly don't withhold shelter or clothing. None of us would say to a child who gets a bad report card, well, you're going to live in the backyard for the next six months. I mean, you just wouldn't do that. So there's this layer of unconditional stuff that you would never, never withhold. And then there's a tremendous layer of stuff that represents wants. The kids expressed wants. There are things they would like to do, things they would like to have, which can rightly be conditional. They have to earn them. They have to help 
with them. And so it's entirely right, I think, to say to kids sometimes when they ask for something, to say, well, I, you, know, you, you really haven't earned this. I don't think you're quite ready for it. Parents sometimes sensibly say, no, you're not ready for a driver's license yet. You know, they've watched all the crashes on the bicycle and they say, yeah, we'll, we'll wait for a little while on that. Or a young child wants to use some of his father's delicate tools and we see his own things lying all over the place, not cared for. And I say, well, you haven't earned this yet. If you really want to do this, here are the kinds of things you have to do in order to earn it. That, I think, can be enormously powerful and not harmful. But stay away from that negative dessert stuff. You've done something bad, so something bad should happen to you. A better way is to say, well, you've done something not good. I mean, you've done something bad. Let's talk about it and see whether we can prevent it's ever happening again. See? And I would do that even with, even with cheating. To, you know, slap a zero on the paper and say, that's it, a zero. You know, if you know even the least little bit of arithmetic, you know a zero is awfully hard to overcome. And you got five scores, one of them is a zero. Shush, add them up and divide by five, and you'll see that that can be enormously damaging. You, you, want, to, you want to stop this behavior but you want to encourage better behavior and leave, leave out there the possibility of, of recovery. It reminds me of something else. <coughs> uh, when I was doing this continuous progress thing in math, I also decided uh, that I would never give a grade lower than 50 when I had to give grades. And so at the beginning of every marking period, kids would get the, all the contract information, uh, and they all started at 50. And then for every test pass, they'd go up a certain number. You know, one test pass, you go up to 65, maybe two tests pass, you go up to 78, or, you know, it differed from marking period to marking period. But we emphasized to them, we said, look, this 50, this 50 is our free gift to you. You start at 50, you don't start at, at zero. And in part, that was, that was a, the product of several years of math teaching and looking at what happens when a kid gets a really, really low grade, like 20 or 30 or zero. It's just incapacitating. You, know, you can't recover from it. So to eliminate that, you say, here's, here's my free gift, 50. You can't do worse than that. And you can do better because you've got all kinds of opportunities to do better. And there's that positive dessert. You have to earn it. Uh, I would never give A's. I mean, that's demeaning, too, to give A's. What you have to do is find a way to help kids to earn A's or B's. Uh, and you know, that's entirely different. Even at the university level, even in places like Stanford and Harvard, there's all this furor over grade inflation. You know, too many people are making high grades. Well, if the professors are giving these grades, then I agree, this is a bad thing, because you shouldn't just give the grades. But if the professors have learned enough pedagogy that they have found ways to help people earn those grades, then it seems to me we should celebrate, right? And at the public school level, we want everybody to do well, right? But if they do, then we say, grade inflation. You're too easy in your grading. You can't win. There you are, stuck. The commissioner of education in New Jersey, not the present one, a past one, actually said in print that the tests in New Jersey had to change. Why? Because too many people were passing them. Too many people were passing them. Here would have been his opportunity to say, hey, the teachers are doing a terrific job. And the kids aren't nearly as lazy as we thought they were. Here's something to celebrate. Uh-uh, it wasn't something to celebrate. You've got to have new tests. They've got to be harder, see? And so whatever standards you have in this state or any other state, woe be unto you when too many of the kids begin to pass them because they'll make them harder. See? So it's, you have to keep 
telling people about that. When they talk about great inflation, you have to say, you know, let's look at it. Let's look at it and make sure that these grades aren't being just given to people. If that's not the case, then we've got a cause for celebration, not one for mourning. Right? Just all over the country, it's more likely that grade point averages will be higher in schools and departments of education than in some other places. Now, is that because professors of education are pushovers? Well, maybe. I mean, you got to consider that. But I've pointed out to people again and again, it may also be because these people know better how to teach. Okay? If that's the case, then you've got something to be proud of. Um, and you should be proud of it. Final message, have fun teaching. <laughs> <laughs>